you, Bonnie. I hope I can live up to that buildup. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. So good morning, everyone. Morning. And uh, happy Memorial Eve to you all. Thank you. And as, as Reverend Bonnie has said, this month our theme is the expectancy of good in, a, uh, in formulating a world that works for everyone. And I'm thinking about you know, that theme, the world that works for everyone, is the theme for the entire year. Uh, in all the Centers for Spiritual Living. So I'm going to start with that one. World that works for everyone. How do we do that? Because people have conflicting ideas about what they want, and conflicting goals. How can it work for everyone? Well, Thomas Troward has a little bit to say about that. He says uh, that the first law of what Ernest Holmes would call the thing itself, what we call spirit or the ultimate, the first law of that has to be a law of harmony. You can't use, you can't have one person use it for one goal, another person use it for another goal, and those goals conflict. What you have to have is have them work in harmony. And harmony comes from a, uh, an ancient root that means to fit together in a pleasing manner. And so that's how we can think of a world that works for everyone. They fit together. All our goals, all our dreams, desires can be made to fit together in some pleasing manner. Now, the other theme that's been going on this year and that have been alluded to in some of the messages is uh, our election. And I think it's interesting to think about a world that works for everyone in the context of the, this election that's going on. So, because elections can be divisive and our whole philosophy is about you know, no separation, no division, how do we reconcile that with these, these divisive thoughts that may come up? And I thought a good practice we might engage in is this. So imagine that the candidate that you probably by now intend to vote against, very few undecideds I think this time, the candidate you intend to vote against because that's the way we tend to vote nowadays rather than voting for, uh, the candidate you, you intend to vote against wins the election in November. Picture that and still have a world that works for everyone. Now to make it a, a tiny bit easier, the candidate that loses the election in November, the world still works for that candidate. You know, the world works for them now and the world works for them in November just fine. You know, they're going to be well, bummed about it, no, no doubt about that, but the world's still going to work for them. So a world that works for everyone is not necessarily one where everybody's, as I said uh, once before, anybody's turning cartwheels or dancing in the street. But let's start with a, a slightly, just the aim of, yeah, it works for everyone, no matter what. Now, I want you to notice something about the way I expressed all that, not just the content of it, the way I expressed it. I said, the candidate wins, present tense, in November. Candidate loses in November. The world works for the other one in November. I've been using the present tense about something in the future. Because the, the second part, or rather the first part of the theme, the expectancy of good, expectancy is about the future. Uh, that's why I uh, requested that both the songs that uh, be played today are about the future including the one from last week, because I liked it so much. So let's talk about expectancy. When uh, Reverend Bonnie spoke the first time and when Randy Granger spoke this month, they both talked about expectancy and used, used the um, example of uh, when a woman is pregnant, we say that she's expecting. And when Reverend Bonnie said that the first time, the first thing that came to my mind was that book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. Because that book talks about it as a process, right? Different things happen at different times. It's, it's not like a woman becomes pregnant in January and nothing happens in between. And then in September, boom, there's a baby, right? There's a process. There are stages that, are, that go through. Uh, how many people here like to uh, grow tomatoes? Yeah, Kathy likes to grow tomatoes. And when you do that, again, you plant a seed in a pot or in the ground. And it's not like nothing shows up until like three or four months later and then suddenly there's tomatoes. 
No, first, first there's a stalk that grows up, and then leaves come on it, and then little flowers, and then, then there's the fruit, then there's the tomatoes. It's a process that takes time, and that things happen along the way. And you notice those things that happen. Now, a lot of times when people will teach us for the first time about uh, the process of treatment, they'll say, well, when you treat for something, when you do a, a mental prayer for it, uh, it's like planting a seed. And when you plant a seed, you don't dig up the soil to see what's happening. And that's very true. And it is also true that you do look at the soil itself to see if that shoot is coming up. You know, a few days go by, is there anything? No. A few more days go by, is there anything? No. If a few more days go by and there isn't anything, you know you have to plant a different seed. That one didn't work. The world gives you feedback on whether what you're doing is working or not. And uh, Emmett Fox, Emmett Fox is a, a New Thought writer and teacher that I think most of you know about. In this book, Make Your Life Worthwhile, he says something pretty good and pretty succinct about that. Uh, Ernest Holmes, founder of Religious Science, talks about it too, but here and there, you know, scattered throughout his writing. And while I have this book up, I wanted to make sure I mentioned this. Uh, Peggy Shin, when she was here, uh, mentioned and referred to a, a book a number of times called This, this Thing Called Life. And sometime not too long ago, that book was reissued under the title, The Art of Life. So if you go looking for this thing called life, you're not going to find it unless you find like an old used copy. But The Art of Life is very, in fact, I think there are still a couple of copies in the bookstore. So just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. So Emmett Fox, here's what Emmett Fox has to say. Emmett Fox, when he's talking about, in this particular essay, about new thought stuff, the, uh, the idea of a, a mental process, he calls what's going on in the world, the conditions, the, the, um, uh, what's, what's happening in your life, he calls that the outer picture, what's, what's showing in the outside world. And he says, when you do your work, you should notice some changes. He says, this is the test. If the outer picture changes, you are working rightly. You are not fooling yourself or just indulging in emotional dissipation. If the outer picture does not change in a reasonable time, like no shoot is coming up out of that soil, you are fooling yourself. You are not working rightly and should revise your method. In NLP, there's a, there's a saying, you know, if, if what you're doing isn't working, do something else. You know, it seems like straightforward advice, but oh yeah. You know, plant, plant a different seed. That seed didn't work. The outer change may be incomplete or even comparatively small as yet, just that little shoot coming up. But as long as the outer picture is changing, you're not fooling yourself, you are getting results. And then he says in italics, there are no invisible demonstrations. And the word demonstration is used uh, throughout New Thought, not just in religious science, and it, it's really very simple. It's something happens in the world, something, some result of your work that demonstrates that what you're doing is working. You know, and you know, to demonstrate is to show something. It shows that it's working. So of course, he's saying, well, you can't show something invisible. It's something that is, that is demonstrable, that is out there in the world for all to see when, you're, when what you're doing does work. Now, uh, in, uh, in the usual introduction that, as, as uh, Reverend Bonnie said, don't need to do anymore, uh, I'm, you people know that I'm a uh, master practitioner of NLP. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about NLP than I usually do in this one, and we can do some. So in, in the field of NLP, neurolinguistic programming, was developed by, uh, in fact, Bandler says made up by, uh, two guys, Richard Bandler and John Grinder. This was back when they were at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And they, start, they developed these methods of, of NLP that were getting a lot of good results and helping people uh, change and get the, get the changes that they wanted. So much so that a number of therapists in the area and then therapists in a wider area, would send the patients that they weren't having any luck with to Bandler and Grinder and saying, you oh, know, these guys, I don't know what they're doing, something different, but it often works. 
And in fact, sometimes, you know, as their reputation grew, people would just come to them on their own who hadn't gone to a therapist. And the story goes, it's in one of the books, one of the early books, that in the very early days of them working with people, uh, a fellow came to them and said, uh, I'd like you to help me to be better at making friends. And they took him on and they said, they, they assumed he had some sort of trouble, some sort of difficulty making friends. And he said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm very good at making friends. It's just I like having friends so much, I'd, I'd like to be even better at it. And Bandler kind of looks over at Grinder, and Grinder kind of looks over at Bandler, and they realize they, they ain't got nothing that can change good into better. It wasn't what they were working on. They were not fixing people's problems, uh, what they called uh, remedial change, as opposed to what they then called generative change. And they started working on that. Now, Reverend Bonnie spoke, I think, both Sundays that she was uh, the speaker here about treatment. And speaking of therapists, therapists talk about treatment. New Thought, not just religious science, has talked about treatment. And we get that word to treat or treatment from medicine, right? You, uh, someone can be treated for gout, treated for diabetes. A therapist might treat someone for depression or anxiety or, you know, treat them for the willies, whatever they've got to be treated for something. And originally in New Thought, most of what they started to deal with was physical ailments and physical difficulties. And so again, they would treat people for tuberculosis or whatever the physical ailment was. But I thought about this word, these words treatment and treat. And I thought, you know, when in Halloween, when the <laughs> kids come to your door and they say, trick or treat, you don't say, oh, well, what issue would you like to be treated for? Right? No, you, you hand them a treat. A treat is something, something pleasant, a, a good experience. So I think in addition to be treated for something, we can start to think about being treated to something. Right? You can be treated to lunch, treated to a night on the town, treat yourself to a day at the spa, where you maybe get a, a facial treatment. Right? These words can be thought of in a different way. And when, when Tina was up here and when all the platform assistants before the message will tell you about these prayer requests that we have, and they'll talk about usually, you know, some, some difficulty that you have that you may not be able to deal with yourself, put in a prayer request. And I think most people, when we hear that, I think that usually there's only like two or three or four prayer requests in the box. Because I think most of us, when, when we're there and we think about it, we say, no, I'm good. I'm good. Well, how about turning good into better? How about in addition to the expectancy of good, the expectancy of even better, the expectancy of more? Because no matter how much good you have, it comes from an infinite source. There's more where that came from. But I think that often we have, well, no, that's, that's about how much of this good I expect to have. Well, maybe expect more than you expect. Expect something better. Now, Ernest Holmes has something to say about this. And I had prepared a uh, CD for Skip to play, but we had some technical difficulties. So we're going to see if my, uh, my backup plan works and see if we can hear this. This is Ernest Holmes talking about Now let us see if we cannot expect something better than we expect. If this is a mental and a spiritual process, which it is, and if something responds to it, which it does, it can only respond to it the way we expect it to. Therefore, we should try to believe beyond our own belief. We should try to expect more than we expect. It's entirely rational that we should expect every good thing to prosper everything we touch to come to life in joy and happiness, in success and in harmony. That we should expect every person we meet to be blessed and helped and made whole. This would be the greatest good of all. 
This is what we expect. This is what we accept of the law of good. Sounds like a world that works for everyone, doesn't it? So I have here some prayer requests that I've prepared. And at the top, and I'm going to ask the, for these to be handed out, uh, at the top, I should have said this before, <laughs> I've written the word more. And at the bottom, I've written the words even better. And I'd like everybody to fill one of these out, even if you haven't filled out one of the prayer requests to be treated for some difficulty. Think about something in your life that is good, that you have a, a lot of, that that's all that you expected right now, but that it would be nice to have even more of. Because again, there's more where that came from. So take, uh, take a couple of minutes as, as we go through this and fill out a prayer request. And those words, more at the top and even better, at the bottom. Let that go into your consciousness of, yeah, I can have more of that. This can be even better. And it could be, you know, something like, you know, I could, I could improve my bowling score. You know, I can improve my, my swimming time. Or I could have, uh, I have enough time for my hobby now, but yeah, have more time for it without impacting something else. So think of something good in your life that can be even better, some skill you have that you can improve at, and put in a prayer request for that. And as you do that, or after you, you write down, start picturing what that would look like, because we're going we're gonna to deal with that later. We're going to get to that later. Now, you might think, you know, bowling score? Really? <laughs> you know, isn't that, isn't that kind of trivial? Isn't that kind of little? You know, do I want to bother you know, God with my bowling score? Isn't it kind of too small? And the answer is no. And Ernest Holmes has something to say about that as well. I was trading for something the other day and the thought flashed across my mind, well, this is unimportant. It was just some little thing I wanted to happen. It was of no great importance to the world or even to me, but it would please me for it to happen. And I thought, the thought came to my mind, suppose somebody should ask you, how do you know that God knows or the law knows what you want or the answer? Isn't that interesting? Haven't you, had, haven't you asked yourself questions? Well, of course, everybody does. And I thought, well, now that's a good one. Somebody will ask me that. I know. And then I got to thinking and I said, well, I will answer this way. There's only one mind and I'm using it. This idea may not be important to anything in the universe, but it's important to the self-expression of what I believe. And for all I know, it's as important as this world is. There's nothing big or nothing little. I think that will answer the question whether or not we can bring our little affairs to this great divinity of person, and of law. Of course we can. Of course we can. Stop. <laughs> of course we can. So I'm going to do a little, little bit of NLP with you guys. So you've been, you wrote down, hopefully, something about some good that you want to have even better. And you started to picture it. Now, I was, as I say, I, uh, I got certified as a master practitioner in NLP from the New York Training Institute. And the following year, I spent the year as an assistant trainer there. And after that, there were a number of students who were starting a study group. And they asked me to lead it for them, and I did. And we did some really interesting stuff. We didn't just recapitulate what was in the lessons. We started using those tools to explore to see what else we could do with them. 
And one of the things that we did with them was to explore how people do anticipation or expectancy in their heads. That is, what is the structure of that? And uh, we found out a way that that happens. And so we're going to do that. We're going to do, because right now, up until now, you hadn't really expected this new thing that you're, that you put in a, put it, going to put in a prayer request for. So let's see if we can develop some expectancy about it. So you've been starting to make a picture of it, and uh, not a mental equivalent yet. Mental equivalents will be talked about next, next month. So it's just a picture of your good or of your better, but it's not yet equivalent to it. You'll learn about that next month. But you have a picture at least. What I'd like you to do is put that picture way up there, just way up there, maybe even higher than the ceiling, because you know your pictures can go higher and even maybe farther away. And uh, if you're sitting behind someone, be careful. But what I'd like you to do is reach out with your arm and see how far your reach is. See how far, everybody, actually do it. How far do your fingers reach? With your eyes open. All of this is done with eyes open. And just mark that place, uh, that, that position, so you know where it is. OK. So you have that picture up there. What we're going to be doing in a moment, bless you. What we're going to, don't be sorry, you're sneezing. <laughs> you apologize for other things, not that. Uh, you have that picture up there. What you're going to do in a moment is have that picture swoop down and then up to right, right past where your arm can reach, right past where, where that spot that you marked. I'm going to do that very quickly. It's going to actually swoop down and rise up. It's not like a straight line. There's that swooping action has something to do with that anticipation, with that expectancy. Swooping from up, up, no, swooping, swooping from up there back to right past where your arm is. So it goes to you. Okay? So we're going to do that on the count of three. One, two, three. Swoop right up there. OK, now, how many feel uh, that's uh, more expectancy about that, more anticipation, more like, oh, that's coming. Oh, that's coming. That's coming. That's, gonna, that's, that's, that's on its way now. Yeah, you feel that. And those of you who don't, you can play the home version of the game uh, <laughs> later <laughs> and try it again. But you notice that, that part of that is also that way I, I was talking just now. It's on its way. It's on its way. Reverend Bonnie in the first message said, you know, it's, it's very different from waiting. You know, oh, God, when is this happening? When is this going to happen? It's never going to show up. No, what you're saying when you're actually anticipating, when you have that expectancy is, it's on its way. It's, it's coming. It's coming. And again, it's not here now. It's about some, something that now, that right now is definitely at some point in the future, like that election. Like if you order something online, and, or in the old days, you know, from Montgomery Ward, uh, not just anything, but something you really, really want, right? There's that anticipation. It's coming. It is coming. And it is coming. Again, that's in the present tense. It is on its way. It is coming. And so it is. 